This podcast has been brought to you by our Patreon account. After almost four years of producing free content in one way or another, we're finally opening up the doors for people to uh, financially support us. For anyone out there that supports what we're doing, believes in us, believes in what we're trying to achieve, uh, feel free to head over to patreon.com forward slash XY advisor. And second of all, we've uh, finally converted our mainly dormant website into a membership site now. It is focused on training. You pay $49 a month, you get one credit to spend uh, on the library of different training courses and those training courses are constantly getting upgraded and constantly getting added to. Uh, We actually give half the money to the course providers because we value what they do. Uh, It's just a really good way for us to, to improve upon the financial advice community. So that's everything. Enjoy the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Hub24, whose purpose is to connect advisors to innovative solutions that create opportunity. They're massive supporters of advisors, in particular those going solo, uh, and they're one of the early players in the managed account space, and, and their epic functionality in that area, as well as their commitment to user experience, has led them to become a market leader in terms of advisor satisfaction. I can speak from personal experience when I say their BDM team are total legends, and they're there to help you work through the best solutions for your business. So you can check out more information at hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. How you doing, Vic? I'm great. Thanks for having me here today, guys. Pleasure. And uh, sort of a, a, I mean, tag along, if mm. you could call it that. Mm. Uh, Last our, minute. Late edition. Yeah. Our buddy, Sean. Mate, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me, boys. Absolutely. So today we're talking all things uh, estate planning uh, and How's this for a little bit of a weird thing? So there is a thing now called super estate, but it's not for estate planning. It's for real estate. So mm. the product is use your super to invest in real estate, but they've called it super estate. And the mm. only thing that I think of when Someone's I hear that- Someone's dying. <laughs> well, <laughs> in a high quality fashion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a super estate. Oh, That's what Vic does. Vic does super estate plan. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'm sure you've got a, a few stories for us. Um, what, what's one of the more hilarious uh, estate plans you've ever <clears throat> been a part of? Yeah, look, so th- this particular client, <clears throat> if you don't know, Sean and I used to work together. And, um, you know, there are a couple of... <clears throat> You know, long nights, and, and this isn't going where you think it's going. But, uh, <laughs> I was about to say, are you in each other's will? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, you know, we it's hush money. <laughs> <laughs> might have a big night out drinking, and then often, you know, we'd get back into the office next day. We'd have back to back clients. Ooh, so yeah. similar to financial planning client, uh, client fills out a fact finder, and, and often if you're a bit ill prepared <clears throat> just before the meeting, you do a quick review of it. <laughs> so have a quick look at the fact find. <clears throat> got this widow sort of client she fills out sort of her family structure and it says you know children and she's got a, a child called Coco Coco and so I go through the asset list <clears throat> you know she's got a couple of million dollar house lots of superannuation so I'm thinking this is great first meeting after a long night out <clears throat> testamentary trust is going to be fine so sit down with the client and ask her look what is it that you want to achieve she says, well, <clears throat> you know, I've got, you know, obviously my daughter and I want to make sure that she's going to be looked after. And so, because I'm not in the right head space this early in the morning, <clears throat> I start going through the benefits of testamentary trusts, talk about how I'm going to save her daughter all of this tax. And after about an hour of speaking to this client, she says, oh, I, I forgot to tell you, my daughter is actually my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and so I say, okay, well, okay, I'm going to have to, like, turn this around a little bit. <laughs> so I start talking to her and say, okay, well, you know, for your daughter, because she really did consider this dog to be her daughter, what is it that you want to achieve? And she said, look, I want to set up a trust with, like, $6 million in it. So I'm sort of thinking, okay, well, I haven't actually done this before, but I'll, I'll, I'll play along. <laughs> And she starts talking about, you know, she wants this trust, she wants the dog to live in her mansion house in Yarralama, <laughs> which is a really rich suburb in Canberra. Right. <laughs> and then I get to the end of it, and with estate plan, you always look at it from two points of view. You look at it, what does a client want to achieve? And from a practical point of view, is this going to work? And I get to the end of the meeting, and I sort of say, okay, well, <clears throat> like, who's going to look after this trust? Because you can't actually give money to a dog, so it's a purpose-type trust. 
And I get to the end, she said, oh, my friend's going to look have the $6 million. They're going to look after the, the, the dog. <clears throat> and then from a practical point of view, I'm thinking, and, and I actually say this to her, what happens if your friend kills your dog and keeps the money? And she just, it just goes quiet. <laughs> She's like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> <And> so, well, <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no trust police. No one is going around saying, Paddy, are you, you know, fulfilling the terms of this trust in accordance with the will? So I said, well, no one's going to police this. They could just kill your dog, bury him in the backyard and keep the $6 million. And she got up and left the meeting. <laughs> So maybe could have been a bit more delicate in the delivery. <laughs> well, it's that finding that balance between being delicate and being realistic as well. Yeah, You're yeah. feeling very realistic yeah, that yeah. morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my and I stand by my advice. <laughs> that is a serious issue. Fair point. Yeah. It always it always confuses me how how did these um, crazy people walk into so much cash? Like how how does someone who is obviously uh, you know, a couple of stubbies short of a six-pack. How, how, how do they end up with $6 million? But you don't need to be intelligent to inherit. Mm. Uh, yes. Sometimes uh, yes. more money allows Vic you to... facilitates that all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit less de- more detached. Yes, it, it can facilitate an increased... I see you on that. Yeah. So that, that obviously plays into... So you obviously... Uh, I grew up with a lot of money then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heaps. Got so with, with the giving the money or allowing access to the money, what is some of it like? How's it go? Do people actually, are you having to lead people to like, oh, you should probably think about these extra clauses around your kids um, from what you've told me? Or are people coming in and telling you, I've got these, these reckless kids and I want to make sure that they have to do this, this and that before they get access? Well, a lot of people say you can't rule from the grave. But my job is all about helping people rule from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you want to lock up money for, like, a child who might be a drug addict or they got gambling issues, well, then certainly that's what we assist clients to do. <clears throat> but as I said, always try to sort of pair it back with a bit of, like, you know, a practical approach to it. So sometimes you just got to say to a client, look, that is crazy. <laughs> Don't <Yeah>. do this. <laughs> How's that go? Will they get up and walk out of the <laughs> no, look, I've, I've only ever had one client walk out of the meeting. And that's because I locked the door now. <laughs> <laughs> Quick learner. <laughs> Right, funnily enough, um, I used to, uh, even though Sean doesn't remember meeting me, we used to work in the same same we, company. We did, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was in the Sydney office and then you turned up and you were sort of like the, the rock star, you know, oh my God, it's Sean, it's Sean. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, everyone, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the smartest guy around. And then next week, yeah, I've just completely left the <laughs> whole company and I'm now employed by, I think it was BT or something you went yeah. to. Yeah. Oh. It's an interesting transition. Yeah, I'd imagine so. I'd yeah. imagine so. And then you've um, gone on and you're, you're almost back in advice at this stage, right? Pretty close. Yeah, so almost close. a decade out and come come, come back in. And um, and obviously you're, you're a pretty uh, pivotal part of this. I, I remember the four of us um, having lunch, I think, a couple of years ago when, when we first met and you, you were setting this company up. Um, are you keeping these boys in line or what's going on? Well, whilst, they, whilst they keep paying the bills, yes. <laughs> Is there bills? <laughs> I, got a special, I put these rules on my inbox where they put them into it. <laughs> I haven't seen one. I haven't seen them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but certainly been uh, helping the guys with their new venture. Mm. Not sure how much I can talk about that. Uh, here, I'll, I'll let, let you okay. talk about it's it. It's all about you, Vic, today. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Vic, I guess guess on that, like uh, Vic's not just an estate planning specialist. He's he's pretty multidisciplinary. And their firm, he's done some pretty cool stuff. Their firm's gone from, like you've won some awards this year. <coughs> yeah, uh, 2016 we were the ninth fastest growing firm in Australia. Whoa. Um, by revenue and by staff size. Whoa. Um, and that sort of went from like 10 staff 2015 to like 40 plus staff. So. Jesus. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you share with the boys the journey? Yeah, look, the, the journey sort of started, um, <clears throat> obviously worked with you guys, um, worked as a head of estate planning at uh, NAB Private Wealth. So I did a small stint in the banks. 
um, realised it wasn't for me. Mm. <laughs> uh, left, worked for a tax law firm in Sydney. Uh, went back to Canberra in 2013 to sort of uh, start a private wealth practice. Um, the motivation for it was, <clears throat> as Paddy said, uh, the other part of my expertise is tax. There's only one other tax lawyer in Canberra. And I <coughs> thought, well, maybe there's a reason there's one tax mm. lawyer there, but I'll give it a crack. Uh, moved down there, started a new practice. Uh, 2015, took over the firm uh, with a friend. Um, we paid pretty much nothing for the firm. It was sort of loaded with debt. So we, we did an arrangement with the former owners, which said, look, we'll take over the firm, we'll rebuild it, the firm will pay off your debt. But if it all goes pear shape and it goes, if we go bankrupt, we're, we're not guaranteeing the debt. <coughs> if, if, it, if it all folds <coughs> over, we just walk away. Yeah, you were just the get out of jail free card. Yeah, and and then they they took that arrangement, um, and then literally within a year, as said, ninth fastest growing firm in Australia. What? Th th there were um, <clears throat> there was a period of time where we thought we were going to go bankrupt, and <laughs> and so w when we bought took over the firm, we thought, look, in six months' time, we'll either the firm would have collapsed, all these people will be unemployed and we'll have no jobs. Or, look, if we give it a crack, uh, maybe we can turn it around. What did you do? Well, uh, we were, we took pay cuts to, to when we took over so we could yeah. uh, give all our staff pay rises. Right. Um, since we owned all the equity, we went out and found some other young lawyers, gave them equity in the firm at a really discounted price, and then we found more people like us who were willing to give it a crack. And then it just grew from there. Now we got five of us, so uh, five directors, equity partners, and then about thirty staff. So that's pretty smart. Mm. Well, I think it's all about you know whether it's financial planning business or, or, or a legal practice. It's all about backing yourself and taking mm. a bit of a gamble. And in hindsight, I look back and go, that was crazy. Like, <laughs> why did we do that? <laughs> and, and even when we went and got you know advice from you know my accountant, the firm's accountant. And they all said, look, don't buy this firm. It's a bad idea. And we thought, no, nah, let, let's buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Look, I hear what you're saying, <laughs> but. And, and one of the interesting things about the firm is it's just purely focused on private work, right? Which is pretty unique in Canberra. Yeah, well, I mean, you are sort of, you know, how we turn it around. It was actually, the firm predominantly did government work. Right. As all firms in Canberra do. Mm. Um Myself and the other director who took over, none of us knew how to do government work. So we said, well, <clears throat> let's not renew all this government panel work. Let's just do private client work, which is all I knew how to do anyway. Yeah. Um, and then it just sort of exploded from there. And it was <clears throat> probably because we're probably the only firm in Canberra who doesn't do government work. So no one was actually focusing on private client work. Wow. Mm. You've walked into a, uh, an open market, essentially. Yeah, I think people think Canberra and think, oh, you know, government sustains Canberra, but there's a lot of really large size and wealthy business owners in, in town mm. and a lot of businesses in the private sector support the government sector. So, <coughs> you know, it was crying out for someone to sort of come in and just focus on those guys. And do you work with financial planners <coughs> much? Pretty much all my work uh, comes from financial planners and, and from accountants as well. So right. I <clears throat> sort of specialise in uh, state planning tax work. And yep. so my practice really integrates with financial planners' uh, practice. So I deal with a lot of financial planners, do all the estate planning for their client, superannuation advice from a legal point of view, yep. tax advice for, for their clients as well. And, and how, how, so let's say uh, I've got a financial planning business, someone comes in, uh, they've, they've got insurance, uh, but they also, you know, need their estate looked at. What is the <coughs> process? How, from an advisor point of view, how do we engage and what, what, what's the next steps? Yeah, I mean, where, um, where estate planning integrates really well into financial planning is where they are fully integrated. So, you know, you guys would probably be aware, you know, when you see a client and you say, look, you've got to go get a will done, mm. you give them the details of a lawyer, client never contacts <laughs> yeah, them, and, yeah, yeah. and you see the client a year later, nothing's been done, client dies, they don't have a will, and then you guys <laughs> clean up the, 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 the mess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually do all my meetings at financial planning uh, offices. Yep. Uh, so I deal with a lot of... Uh, like financial planning businesses and I service pretty much all of their clients. Awesome. So they'll book in, when their client comes in for a review meeting, they'll book in 
me to attend that meeting. Cool. <clears throat> uh, prior to the meeting, I would have sat down with a financial advisor, gone through the fact finder, and we'd go through <coughs> strategies or recommendations. <coughs> yep. And often they, often they, as I said, they fit very well together. So a good example is you might have seen a client who, you know, you've been trying to get them to get some insurance. You've given them all the recommendations, but the client is just sort of sitting on that advice. They're not really uh, progressing with it. I might see that client, they might have like a blended family and so insurance might be a good way of increasing the size of the estate so that they can give that insurance to a particular beneficiary. Or likewise, I might look at their asset position and say, well, you've got a lot of assets and wealth, but you've got a lot of debt and your, asset, your estate actually isn't worth much. <clears throat> and that's really the opportunity to me, for me to then go to the client, look, the guys have already given you the advice for the insurance. You're now doing your estate planning in order for us to make sure it all complements each other and we actually <clears throat> are achieving the outcomes that you want. You've got to go ahead with the insurance as well. Mm. But as I said, um, it's um, and then you know I'll, I'll give the client all the recommendations, uh, send them a letter of advice. Um, once they decide to go go ahead with it, I sit down with the advisor. <clears throat> we make sure we've covered off everything like trusts, insurance, superannuation. And then um, I meet the client at my office and we sign documents. So because you don't need it looked at every year, right, your estate plan. So uh, we were talking before with um, a, a, an advisor that specialises in, in wealth um, transfer from generation to generation. Is that the kind of stuff that you find your most meetings that you're in? The parents are there, the children are there, you, 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 you're handling both sides? Yeah, look, it's rare to get a, a meeting where parents and children are all there in the same meeting. Okay. Uh, where I do those meetings is where there's a business involved. Yeah. And so often we're, we're doing like a business succession strategy for the client where, you know, they might have built up this business. They've got one child who works in the business. Um, they've got another child who sort of is doing their own thing. We need a plan to sort of, you know, hand over the business to that particular child, but also you know, potentially give other assets to the other child. Well, yeah. I mean, if you want to travel the world and be lazy, right, you should definitely still be able to get the fair share as the kid that puts in all the work. Surely, right. Yeah, Surely. absolutely. And, and that obviously feeds into the estate litigation practice when people start contesting. But, um, yeah, so we, we do a lot of those meetings and usually – the accountant gets involved as well, and usually the financial planner will be there really project managing everyone and sort of guiding the client uh, <coughs> down the sort of process. Mm. So, so with, uh, oh, excuse, yes, sir. another thing to probably call out, and, and I've obviously known Vic for a long time, we've worked together, been very close friends, but you know, his ability to play up the value chain into some of the more complex tax spaces <coughs> for the same clients, and my dad in, in his case, you know, is really something that's probably quite different to a lot of the estate planners in the market, I think. What sort of what sort of complexity do you like? What do you have to navigate when you when you're sort of going through that process? Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people just when they think estate planning, they just think, oh, it's just a will, and then maybe some death benefit nominations for super. But when you're dealing with like exactly. a business structure, <clears throat> all of a sudden there's a lot of complexity there because it's okay. Well, what is the structure? Maybe they operate it through a family trust, but you've got two kids who need to come in and take control. So mm. what's the mechanism in which the two kids are going to get control and the family trust being a non-estate asset isn't even dealt with in the will. Um, so we're, we're looking at structure, we're looking at tax, asset protection, and then obviously balancing the estate and contestation issues. So, you know, that's really, I guess, a good example of where all of our expertise around the table comes in and we can sit down with a client and achieve some really cool stuff. And sometimes that means actually completely restructuring the client. So as I said, if they're in a family trust, maybe we look at moving them into a company structure. So then issuing shares that can then pass on mm. uh, to the children. Mm. It's, it gets a lot more technical. Whoa. It, it can get uh, incredibly technical once, as I said, depending on what the structure is. Mm. I mean, unless it's just a sole trader, which if they got good advice, they shouldn't be a sole trader. <clears throat> but unless they're a sole trader, then all the assets just go in accordance with their will. If it's some other kind of structure, as I said, we've got to deal with the complexity of the structure, but then also maybe restructure them into something else. He, he, here's a question, um, and it's not a state plan, but I think you're probably the right person to ask. It's, um, it's the idea between, say, equal ownership 
um, let's say two people own a company 50 50 but one person <coughs> is on holiday for six months of the year and one person is working 12 months of the year um, are you talking about Sean and Patty? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was saying exactly the same thing. <laughs> uh, specifically not Sean and Patty. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but, but in general, uh, let's say a company is, is, it has a profit of a million dollars. You've got two. Uh, yeah. And is there, can you separate a dividend distribution based on effort without affecting ownership? Yeah, <clears throat> so there's essentially two different mechanisms to sort of try to balance it or incentivize, you know, someone who works more than the other person. <clears throat> the first way is through salary. So in addition to getting your profit distribution, you could have a like a, a, a formula which then determines what your salary is. So <clears throat> I'm not sure which one of you guys are the ones that is on holidays all the time. Probably Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so Paddy, because you work in the business a bit more. Um, this is a laugh. M- m- maybe. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> because you, you work in the business more than Sean, you should potentially get paid more. And maybe we work out, okay, for every sort of day that you work in the business, you get paid X amount. So mm. there's your incentive That's to good. actually work more, more hours. <laughs> Uh, the other way to do it is if you don't want to do it through salary, <clears throat> then we're potentially doing it through distributions, like profit distributions. And you can't you can <clears throat> sway profit distributions. No, so, so you can't. So if you've got a company with two ordinary shareholders, yes. 50 50, yes. you can't stream dividends to one shareholder. Right. So if we're going to declare a dividend of 100 grand, yep. it's going to get split equally between mm. the two shareholders. Okay. But one way to do it is to. <clears throat> introduce new classes of shares. So we might issue like an A-class share to Paddy. Yep. Sean might get like a B-class share. Maybe even C. Yeah, maybe C. <laughs> maybe <laughs> even <right>. D. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, and then uh, You get a promissory, <laughs> promissory note. <laughs> Why, Why, are you Why did I agree to this? <laughs> Why did I agree to this? <laughs> uh, and then essentially, if Paddy meets... the public record now. <laughs> <laughs> if Paddy meets like certain requirements... The A class share gets like a preferential dividend. Awesome. <clears throat> Sean could get a dividend on his, and then once they both been sort of received their amount, they declare another, another dividend on the ordinary shares. Right. And that goes equally between the and, two. And, of them. and for as hilarious as that uh, scenario <coughs> is, the, the reason that I was asking is probably more so for those younger advisors that are buying into practices, mm. and you get the uh, the older advisor who's working less, going on holidays, but you know they, they might still own. 80% of the business, um, the the new advisor who's brought in maybe 20% is doing all the work. They're getting maybe $100,000 per year as salary, um, but making the owner an obscene amount of money that they're not seeing. So in a situation like that, <coughs> how would you tackle it? Yeah, I mean, for uh, so for a young advisor who's buying into practice, I mean, <clears throat> I guess there's so many different considerations. One is how do you structure that purchase? So one one option is you agree on a figure, the advisor then goes to a bank, borrows some money, and then just purchases those shares. And I'd say that's probably how it's most commonly done. The other way to do it is uh, you could have it vendor finance. So <clears throat> essentially the shares come across to the young advisor. They bought, bought those shares at an agreed value. And then there's an amount which is owed back to the older advisor and they agree that they'll pay it off over a period of time. The other way to do it, which is probably not really commonly done, but I think it's the better way to do it, is to come up with like an earn-out arrangement where you agree with the older advisor, we're going to buy your practice for X amount. And that might involve a small amount up front, let's just call it $200,000. And then the trail bit that is owed to the older advisor is dependent on maintaining profitability of the firm or even potentially growing it so that that's really the incentive for the older advisor to make sure that all those clients are transitioned to the younger advisor Mm -hmm. and that they're actually not just sitting back collecting their hundred grand a year they actually need to actively work in the business to maintain that profitability otherwise the amount they're going to receive is going to reduce so for every young advisor (laughs) who's out there right now thinking about buying a practice what is the one piece of advice that you'd give them? 
Yeah, don't do them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, like, like, like. I mean, said controversy. <laughs> okay. No, no, Why? no. Why? No, no, no. I, I'm going to. I like the answer. It's, it's not that I, I mean, it, I wasn't expecting it. But if that's what you honestly feel, I, I, I What are the challenges it. that you see when. No, look, no, no, no. Let's the, this the, 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 um. Look, I guess it's with like any kind of business. You've got to really look at what are you actually buying. And so if I was looking at buying a financial planning practice, I want to look at the reputation of the actual financial planning practice and also the, you know, the, the older advisor, <clears throat> um, but also looking at the demographic of the client base because are you taking over client base <clears throat> which is essentially dormant or is it a young, really active um you know, um, book, book of clients. Um, but ultimately, when you're looking at any business, <clears throat> it's all about like cash in the bank. So it's all about what amount of money you're going to have at the end of every week in your pocket. And if that's not an amount that is going to allow you to live a really comfortable <coughs> life, but also, you know, invest and do other things, then you probably shouldn't do it. Mm. I might just add something to sort of the front end of that, which is something I've seen a number of times where people have gone, gone into a practice on a discussion and intent for a buy-in but the deal isn't done and it's, it's, it's sort of conceptually agreed mm. and they've been using this practice on a promise of something that then sometimes best intentions but situations change and then you know they get burnt and basically then they're off they're frustrated they're disappointed they've got to go and find a whole nother opportunity and so um you know, I've seen it many, many yeah, times. We saw it more with a lot of the guys that came out of Horizons, AMP Horizons. Um, yeah, definitely. Unless it's in, unless it's in a contract, mm. it ain't happening. It yeah. ain't happening. And and the the advice I'd give from experiences I've seen is, you know, the best thing to do is always to cut the deal on the way in Absolutely. to the business. Mm. Um, and, and that's difficult if you've grown through in that business, you know. Um, but certainly, if it's at a point in your career where you're talking about that on the way in. Definitely do the deal mm. on the way in. And there's a big difference between buying a business that's going to make you lots of money and you can sell later on and buying your job. And a lot of people make that mistake of spending all this money just to buy their own job mm. to make the same amount of money. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so do you have a digital solution or something? <coughs> is, that, is that something you do? Yeah, we, we, we do. Um, so we created, um, probably about a year ago, we created uh, Mode Legal. Mode uh, Legal. Yeah, which is essentially an online wills platform. Yeah. Um, so it's focused for like your younger clients who <clears throat> you might see them and tell them, look, you need to get a will. Maybe they're single, maybe that they don't have significant assets, so <clears throat> you know they don't want testamentary trust wills, they don't want to spend a lot of money, and they just don't want to go and see a lawyer. So this is a good option for them where they can sit in the comfort of their own home and pretty much instantly draft a will, which is fully automated and generates in a couple of minutes. Cool. Do you, do you do more than just wills on that? Uh, so we previously created a system which actually did everything, um, and, and what we realised is... There's, there's a certain uh, number of services that, or like legal service or legal products which it doesn't matter that I can actually automate my entire job and it can do, do everything that I do. But sometimes clients just actually want to sit across the table from someone yeah. who explains it to them. And, you know, even though it might be the exact same outcome if they did it online, um, as I said, so I've sort of shifted back towards just the face-to-face -face work, but we still have an online solution. And it works really well for some clients. Um, but as I said, I've, I've just found that <clears throat> what I thought was going to be the, the solution and clients were just going to all use this, they'd never have mm. to meet me. <clears throat> Uh, I just real I didn't I underestimated the value of actually meeting mm. someone. It's the same with financial planning that sure. often you know you might be able to actually tell a client what they should be able to do, but it's actually the journey that you take a client on when you're talking to them, you're meeting them, yeah. and, and you know their ability to ask questions because actually what you're selling is not a, a financial planning product or a legal product. It's actually the relationship and the confidence mm. that you give a mm. client. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, and well. I was been talking about this a little bit but um google just brought out this ai they can have a conversation and um as in it on their their uh, it's called duplex um uh, and it made a call and could book in a haircut appointment um and the, you can hear the whole conversation it's you know it's very 
very variable and and but and it, the AI actually the voice was like matching the person they were yeah, calling that was around. the interesting <laughs> yeah, thing. yeah yeah and it they, wasn't um, like a robotic sort of Google um, yeah. Google assistant or Siri mm, yeah yeah it's and, really and and to to your point um, I think a lot of that stuff is going to help educate people and 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 make people more confident but at the end of the day. Um, People want to talk, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm happy to pay an extra 200 bucks or whatever it is just to sit in front of you for 15 minutes and you just go, now, Clayton, this is your will and this is what you do and this is, or maybe not will or the other things, mm. right? Um, this is, and, and I'm just willing to pay that because I go, okay, Vic told me that. <laughs> yeah, know? no, well, I think it's true and I think... Um I think there's more, obviously, technology is going to change both industries, whether it's financial planning or legal, but I don't think it'll fully remove no, the advisor yeah. because there's, um, you know, there's a lot of clients who just want that face-to-face -face Definitely. relationship with someone. Mm. Definitely. Yeah, I think it, it'll help the people that don't get advice, mm. um, but the people that, that want advice, and, yeah. I, and, that, and that's even recognising the price point difference, right? Like, you've got a price for the online world versus the face-to-face -face experience and... Yeah. yeah, I mean, with our online will, um, for a standard will, it costs client 300 plus GST. <clears throat> I charge a client about 600 plus GST if they came and saw me. I lose money on it like because <clears throat> of the time meeting with the client, taking instructions, yeah, right. drafting it. But um, clients are actually willing to pay twice as much for the exact same product. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Is this how it is? It's a tiered pricing model? Yeah. It's how advice sort of needs to adjust a little bit. But are you seeing, <clears throat> I mean, obviously robo advice and all of that are, are coming out. Is that changing the it's FP a, space? It's a great question. It's, it's, I don't think yet, you haven't really seen anything that does it well enough to really get into the space, but that, that <clears throat> stuff's coming. And, and what I might um, overlay on there is it's almost not, you know, let's say it's not about the advice so much, it's the engagement. Mm. You're engaging people in a financial space. And I think that's where it's going to be more, whether it's like you're not having to produce a plan automatically, you're not having to auto invest automatically. You just want to give them what, as long as you're facilitating their financial needs and making it easy, that is what I think is actually what the robo space is going to be. Like stuff will pivot off that, mm. but like you just need to get their attention. And if and and it's just sort of tapping into what 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 are their needs at the time and they're making it really accessible. So I reckon that's sort of and that's why that will will structure is really good. But but I guess the will structure it's sort of what leads into that will structure. So you mm -hmm. got advisors that'll be referring, um, and that's that's where mm -hmm. it works really well. But he, what's the digital solution look like that gets people into the will without a person? Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's where you really <coughs> yeah, it's the hybrid. That's that's that, I'm <laughs> I'm very infatuated with this sort of concept, and like I got lots of ideas and there's lots of things in the works. But I think that's to to create that. I think that's really, and it's not just to wills; it's to all sorts of other mm. financial services that traditionally people are only aware of um, when they come up on that need, or when like they car insurance, where then oh, they need home and contents or whatever it is. And advisors, like a lot of the time, that sort of stuff. And wills, wills have been in this space. And advisors like, oh, I know a lawyer. Like, here we go. But there's all these other needs that come up like that in a conversation that I think you make it more accessible. Well, it, it, it surprises me that clients are willing to buy things like insurance online, mm. which has like a 50-page terms and conditions, mm. which no one reads. But ask them to do like a will online, and a lot of <laughs> older clients are just like, no, no, I can't do that. But as I said, it's just that um, that mindset. I've, people are just not fully ready for receiving s legal services in that particular way. <clears throat> mm. But look, c certainly a lot of um, you know, like AI legal advice. There's a lot of big law firms who are drafting contracts for clients using basically an I a AI system. Mm. Yeah, wow. AI is. Mm going through the legal profession pretty pretty quickly, hey? It's, <clears throat> I think we're the probably the last profession who's held out. <laughs> and, and it's probably because we've got a, a, quite a, 
<clears throat> like an old uh, sort of, um, you know. You guys made it complex just for the sake of it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, just, <laughs> no that, 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 that's the benefit of self-regulation. <laughs> 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 How do we build up a moat around this industry? Yeah. <laughs> Just use boring words that no one wants to use. <laughs> yeah. So they, they flip the pages and they don't last past five because they fall asleep. That's but, it. I mean, that's sort of what motivated us to do legal services online because a lot of the legal industries sort of takes the view, well, we're lawyers, we've studied for X period of time, like a robot can't do what, what we do. <clears throat> Let's just make it so complicated that you have to go through us and then we control the price as well. <laughs> is um, that a bank? What bank used to be? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, you know, my view, uh, and I'm similar to you, Patty, I'm all about, um, you know, accessing different services in different ways. How do we use technology? So <clears throat> my view is, well, it's the same process. Like we can automate a process where a system asks the client a series of questions. Depending on how they answer that, it sort of rebuilds a document, takes out particular clauses, sticks in new clauses. It's the exact same process that I go through when I dra draft a document for a client that I see. So my view is there's no reason why it actually can't all be automated. Yeah. What are you going to do when that happens? Retire. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as you're the one that creates the automation, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's the key. <laughs> or going to financial planning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, apparently, well, today we were talking about how like advisors are so essential and they can't be automated. I agree. <laughs> I actually have no doubt that that's true. I'm not sure if you do. <laughs> you, you, you look sheepish when you when you I say don't that. Know. I oscillate between the two ideas. I'm like, and then, Mate, I, see, no and then I see some new technology. I'm like, there's no way. Mm, it, literally, when I started mm, talking about that duplex thing, the first thing mm, people come out with is is I would hate to speak to a, 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 a computer and not know it was a computer. Like, b b do you mm. remember when Google Glass came out? <clears> the reason <throat> they didn't take off is because everyone <clears> was like, no, no. I, you, like you're being way too digital right now, yeah. and and tech because of the nature of exponential growth, doubling every two years, um, it, it, people just uh, we're not keeping up with the with the rise of tech, and it's happening way too quick. I don't think people are going to be comfortable with it. But just isn't it really? Time, Clay. No, I don't think. It, isn't it really with. just a tool which we use to service clients? So why don't just yeah. mean you have more boutique planners? out there servicing more clients because they've got systems which can actually facilitate a lot of the work which they yeah. used to have to manually do. Ironically, <coughs> I think, like a lot of people worry about like the small end of town in terms of all the challenges that are in the financial planning industry, but ironically, as the tech plays through and it gets better and better and the stuff that we talk about that's going to be trying to knock on the door of replacing an advisor, the better that gets, the more it empowers, like it, it more it weights it onto the actual authorised representative and... They, they become the gold of like the most required thing in that whole process because mm. at the because that the tech <clears> just <throat> takes care of all the other stuff and like you can have all this great tech but oh um, can I talk to someone yeah. um, well, we've been reviewing that price waterhouse paper that came out this year I think and they're talking about customer experience across a number of industries and um, the weighting of the view of um, how much technology and the human will play into it is actually shifting back to the techno uh, back to the human yeah, over man. the last few years, except for, interestingly, in Japan, massively ahead of the world in terms of Moving their desire tech. to want to accept services, accept service delivery without a human involvement. Yeah, but Japan is a weird, weird country. Exactly. <laughs> Japan, it is, it, but it, as it they really through, are. But like as it comes through, it will still, you know... In so many ways, real, in so many ways, real, ways Japan yeah. is one of the most unique countries in the world. They're, totally. They are they're yeah. very, you know... Oh, the insular nature of it. Yeah, it's, it's, very insular. But, it's, but it was, yeah, yeah it's really selling the pushback to the human and that the digital just enables and, and creates the experience around that human core. Yeah, man. I'm, I, I absolutely. And, and I think in the same way that we had the kickback from the Google Glass, I think the more that technology is, is hitting us on the face, <laughs> I think the more that we're going to say, no, no, like it's moving from a tool to my master and I don't like that. I, I, and hopefully, I mean, if you get into a worst case scenario, AI ends up becoming so smart that they the singularity is reached, and you know, and 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 you know, which is to to be honest, Elon Musk's uh, greatest fear for mm. the human race. He thinks it's our greatest threat. So it's definitely, oh man, I, I, it's kind of weird to think about the next five to ten years. It's really weird. 
but really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. didn't spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah. Um, mate, is there is there anything that that you want to cover directly, as in how like people get in contact with you and things like that? Uh, yep. So I work for a firm called Chamberlain's. Uh, www.chamberlains.com.au. Um, <clears throat> also wrote two of the only textbooks on testamentary trusts. You're having trouble uh, getting to sleep? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are they called? Uh, and, and so it's called uh, it's called testamentary trust strategies and precedents. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. I, 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 I personally really wanted to call it uh, Fifty Shades of Estate Planning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, on a serious note, I actually, I actually wrote it for financial planners and lawyers. So it's actually, uh, it's not a massive book, but it actually includes strategies on estate planning. <clears throat> so for blended families and awesome. things like that. So it's a really good tool for financial planners, lawyers and accountants. Um and uh, it's sold by LexisNexis. Um, I do get paid royalties on it, so please, please purchase the book. Yeah. <laughs> LexisNexis. But yeah, no, it's um, otherwise. Um, <clears throat> I'm in Sydney, um, based in Canberra, but uh, in Sydney every fortnight. So I deal with a lot of financial planners in the CBD, but also around uh, outside of the city. So if anyone uh, has any questions about estate planning or <clears throat> wants to look at a solution on how to integrate it into their business. Uh, certainly reach out. And Vic is also going to be likely to be one of our... You're going to do one of our courses, Vic? I will. Yes. On, 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 the, uh, on the XY portal? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. All right, mate. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Cheers, mate.